So this is a kind of project of bringing together two parts of the work I've done before and observing that they really don't uh, fit well together and wondering what to do about that. Uh, so I'm going to be talking a fair bit about this view that is called modal necessitarianism. Uh, it's a kind of very strong uh, form of the view that the laws of nature are necessary. Uh, it's about the strongest view of, of that kind uh, I know of. Um, but I, I like it. I believe it. I think it's uh, a good view of laws. It kind of helps explain uh, how laws do the, the lawsy things that they do. Uh, and it also falls out of a, a view of modality that I like. Um, so I'll say a little bit about modern necessitarianism and why you should like it. Um, and then I'm going to raise three different kinds of uh, challenges to modal necessitarianism um, based on uh, counter-possible reasoning uh, of various kinds. But it will turn out that uh, although the first of these objections is really only an objection to modal necessitarianism, uh, the other two objections uh, affect a wider range of views, including ones that probably uh, some or most of the people in this room are inclined to believe. So I'm going to kind of, kind of parlay something that initially looks like a challenge just for my rather eccentric view into a challenge for everybody. That's the plan. So what is modal necessitarianism? Uh, it's, uh, this term, was, as far as I know, was coined by Schaffer because uh, he's distinguishing between these three kinds of necessitarianism. Um, you don't need to worry about the distinction between the first two for the time being. Um, uh, but those first two I think of as fairly weak forms of necessitarianism. Indeed, I don't really think of them as views about the laws of uh, nature and their modal strength at all. I think of them as views more about the individuation of properties. So when you get dispositional essentialists saying, like Alexander Byrd, this paper necessarily salt dissolves in water, and Helen Beebe uh, has a paper saying, no, it doesn't, and um, uh, a contingent laws rule, I think that was uh, the title of hers. So, um, but they're, they're discussing kind of whether, uh, from my point of view, uh, salt necessarily dissolves in water. But they agree that there is some possible stuff, really like salt, that doesn't dissolve in water. They're just disagreeing about whether that should count as salt. Uh, so from my point of view, they're disagreeing about property identity, not about the modal status of laws. They, they agree about the same kind of general kinds of, what general kinds of things can happen. Whereas modal necessitarianism uh, disagrees strongly about that. It says the laws of the actual world, the, the laws that fundamental physics discovers and um, uh, that higher level sciences discover insofar as there are like, genuine emergent laws, those laws apply at all the worlds. Um, so there just aren't any worlds where stuff happens at all that would be uh, in conflict with the laws of our world, whatever we decide to kind of, whatever properties we think there are um, at those worlds. Um, and the reason for focusing on this view is because I think it's kind of the best version of necessitarianism. Schaffer kind of actually thinks also that in a sense it's the best version of necessitarianism. And he thinks all the only reasons to believe necessitarianism, to think that the laws of nature are necessary, support this really strong view. So his kind of point is that your reason to believe necessitarianism point you here, but this view is, is crazy. And the, like, the less crazy views, there aren't any particularly good reasons to believe. Um, so like, no version is, is very good. But I want to go for the strong thing that there is some reason to believe and argue that it's not as crazy as you might have thought. And in particular, the kind of challenge to it that I'm going to be considering is this uh, challenge from counter-nomics. That is, counterfactuals with nomically impossible antecedent conditions. Uh, and if modern necessitarianism is right, then nomically impossible antecedents are metaphysically possible antecedents. They just, those antecedents, just can't, if they violate the actual laws, then they just can't happen. Full stop. So because it kind of makes the strongest claims in this vicinity, um, it faces the biggest threat from counter-nomics. Uh, Maybe you can kind of, these sorts of necessitarianisms can kind of somehow explain away counter-nomics as like not about the properties we thought they were about or something like that. But no such strategy is going to be available here. So I'm kind of attempting to like be addressing the strongest version of this objection. And any response that works from the modal necessitarianism perspective is going to work for these other necessitarianisms as well, I think. So I'll just talk about this MN from now on. 
just to expand on it a bit, uh, what it does is uh, ends, up, ends up collapsing together metaphysical modality with physical modality. Um, so uh, if you're wondering like, what the space of metaphysical possibilities is like, just go look at, uh, well, when we've got it, the true fundamental uh, physics. Look at what the state space, the kind of space of allowed histories in particular, of, uh, is for that theory. That's going to be that's going to give you the space of genuine metaphysical possibilities, um, and the, a kind of core thought, at least to the way I want to develop modern necessitarianism, is that uh, counterfactual evaluation um, is tied to the genuinely possible histories. So, counterfactual discourse is kind of limited to using the resources of the genuine possibilities, that is, the gnomic possibilities, um, for saying what would happen in these genuinely possible uh, scenarios uh, if they were to occur. Um, there is a really strong version of modern necessitarianism which says it's not just the laws that are non-contingent but the boundary or initial conditions of the universe. Um, I don't think anyone has ever given that a name before. Maybe they, no doubt they have but I just don't know about it. Um, I call it strong mode of necessitarianism here. That's actually the kind of version of the view that I would endorse, but virtually nobody uh, else would. Um, so why believe modern necessitarianism? Well, there's these three arguments that I discuss um, in uh, this paper of mine called Schaffer, of Law Schaffer on Laws of Nature from 2013. Uh, so the first two uh, arguments Schaffer gives himself and then uh, rejects, but I think they're good, and I think his reasons for rejecting them are bad, and you can read the paper if you, you want to know exactly why. Um, so the first is, why do we care about laws? Uh, why, is, why are laws of nature the kinds of things that we're interested in? Uh, maybe there are various other kinds of explanations of that, but modern necessitarianism gives a very straightforward explanation of that. Um, they tell us what really can happen. It's obviously something we would want to know about. Uh, there's an argument that's kind of a variant, and that's to do with counterfactuals. We, we engage in a lot of counterfactual thinking. Uh, we, you know, we kind of think about how, how it would be if it wasn't raining heavily right now. Um, and when we do that, we hold fixed the laws of nature. Why do we do that? There's lots of other stuff that we don't hold fixed. Why are the laws of nature special in that they're the things that get held fixed in nearly all of our ordinary counterfactual liberation? Uh, you, that's something that should be explained. Modern necessitarianism gives a straightforward explanation of that. Uh, kind of all of the counterfactually relevant possibilities have the same laws as ours, because all possibilities have the same laws as ours. Um, and then there's this modal epistemology argument. Modal epistemology is really hard, but modal necessitarianism makes it easier, because we know how to investigate the state space of the fundamental physical theory, and if that just is the space of objective possibilities, then we now know how to investigate the space of objective possibilities just by doing stuff we're already doing. Um, we don't need some extra uh, method for establishing what's metaphysically possible, like no, no need for conceivability or anything tricky like that. Uh, so those are kind of general reasons. There's also this super specific reason that only I um, have for believing modern necessitarianism, which is that there's this beautiful theory that I commend to you all of uh, the nature of modality I call quantum modal realism. I have a book about it that's coming out. And that theory entails modal necessitarianism. Um, so that's, that's my reason, my main reason. So challenges uh, uh, to modal necessitarianism are, are many. They, some of them come from intuition. I'm not worried about those. The one that I've always been most worried about, and I've been thinking about this for years and years and years, and this is my attempt to still wrestle with this kind of old problem, um, is the apparent challenge from physical theorizing. So we're doing physics. We want to work out what's true. Uh, in order to work out what's true, we want to consider like a range of possible theories uh, about in physics. So we can like, consider um, a string theory and consider some other theory of quantum gravity, like loop quantum gravity, and we want to like, compare them. One natural way to compare them is to ask, well, what would be the case if this theory were true, list its counterfactual consequences, 
And then like, what would be the case if that theory were true? List its counterfactual consequences and then compare those consequences for like internal consistency, but also compare them to what we know about the empirical data in the world. It looks like we need to reason uh, with counterfactuals of the form if theory T uh, were correct, then dot, dot, dot. And that looks like we need to consider counterfactuals about alternative uh, possible worlds in which those, uh, those different theories are correct. Um, so just for concreteness, suppose that um, uh, string theory is actually like the correct approach to quantum gravity. Some string theory will turn out to be fully vindicated in the, in the future. Um, then according to modal necessitarianism, String theory is part of the laws of our world, so it's necessarily uh, true. And so all of these counterfactuals are, in fact, counterpossibles. Uh, I'm not going to go through them all, but they all consider as their antecedent some physical hypothesis that at one stage was like an open theoretical possibility for us, um, but is inconsistent with string theory. And so if string theory is uh, true and therefore necessarily true via MN, then these are false, these antecedents are false and indeed necessarily false. Uh, and yet it looks like they have differences in truth values. Like they've been designed, some of them are meant to be really plausible, um, some of them are meant to be uh, really implausible looking, and so we can't say that they all just like, go trivially true or something like that because it seems like they have different truth values and it also seems like they're the kinds of things we might use when, like, you can imagine... Uh, uh, some, I mean, it's a bit of a kind of, uh, it's a very stylized physicist that would actually assert one of those. Um, but you can, like, in principle, that's the general sort of thing that you might find, like specific versions of those sorts of counterfactuals being considered in a physics department by physicists trying to work out which theories are correct. And that's like, a, that's a challenge to modern necessitarianism. It seems like Part of our epistemic practice is to assess these counterfactuals and to ascribe them non-trivial truth values, but it's hard to see how to ascribe them non-trivial truth values given modal necessitarianism, because they're all saying, if the impossible were to obtain, then dot, dot, dot. So one way that's quite popular to handle counterpossibles these days is to bring in some non-trivial apparatus to do that, something like impossible worlds. Uh, so you say that the truth conditions for uh, if um, there was a round square, if, if I was to encounter a round square uh, in the pub this evening, I would be very surprised. Um, like the uh, truth conditions for that involve an impossible world where I do encounter a round square and am very surprised. And it's like, because I'm very surprised at the nearest impossible world in which I encounter a round square, uh, the counterfactual holds. And I'm going to have very, pretty much nothing to say about that impossible world's account, because, partly because if you accept it, the kind of problem that I'm worried about just goes away. In fact, all of the problems I'm worried about today just go away. Um, and so it would be very easy for me to kind of respond to this challenge for modern necessitarianism by adopting the impossible world's treatment of these counterfactuals. But I think it would be too easy a way out. At least I want to see whether we can get out of the problem even without uh, giving us ourselves impossible world semantics. Um, and there's actually this particular uh, condition, this principle that uh, I think is super plausible, is part of my broader account of modality that I mentioned, but I just think it's, it's kind of really plausible, really, uh, or at least until recently, was really widely held, and it's kind of at the core of the uh, like philosophical uh, plausibility of the Lewis Staunacher possible world style semantics for counterfactuals. What counterfactuals are about are genuine possibilities. Um, it's what kind of the, the, I wouldn't say the centrality of uh, this principle to those pictures is witnessed by the fact that Lewis and Staunacher go to kind of great lengths to deny non-trivial counterpossibles. Um, uh, they they, they in, w want to say that all counterpossibles just are trivially uh, trivially true, at least Lewis, Lewis does. Um, and, but I, ju I just find this principle really plausible. 
that's what counterfactuals are about. They're about genuine alternative possibilities and how things go at them. And I think that helps explain why we reason counterfactually as well, but I'm not going to defend it anymore now. Um, and so if we want to preserve that, then these counter-nomics do go trivial. Uh, they're all, these, these counter-nomics are all about the impossible circumstance, um, and anything you like obtains at the impossible circumstance, the kind of null set of worlds. Um, and so what we then need to do is to explain the role that these uh, counter-nomics play in our physical theorizing in a way that's compatible with them having trivial truth conditions. And I think you can do that. I'm going to try to do that anyway. But, um, sorry, there should have been a not in this. Uh, so I even if uh, the kind of... Even if you think that this kind of maneuver uh, isn't going to work and it's kind of a bad science model of necessitarianism that it has to go through these contortions, you get a structurally very similar situation when it comes to uh, counterfactuals with antecedents that violate metaphysical truths, like truths of metaphysics or truths of mathematics, um, and, tru and truths, logical truths. But you get the same phenomenon where it looks like you want to consider those counterfactuals with metaphysically, mathematically, logically impossible antecedents um, when developing your theories in metaphysics or mathematics or logic. At least, prima facie, it seems like you're going to consider like if this other logical theory were true, then what this would follow and that would follow when you're trying to work out what logic is correct. If this, this you know, universal composition were correct, um, then such and such would follow when you're doing metaphysics. Um, and so, really, you're going to have to have a... If you're going to give a kind of systematic metaphysics, you're going to have to have a treatment of counter-metaphysicals, counter-mathematicals, uh, counter-logicals, um, or at least a treatment of their apparent epistemic role in our reasoning. And so if you have one of those, you can use it to account for the uh, counter-nomics from the modern necessitarian perspective as well. So I want to say modern necessitarians aren't really any worse off um, when it comes to what kind of ideology they need in their theory. They still they need a box for kind of counterfactuals with genuinely possible antecedents that get the non-trivial truth conditions, and they need a box for counterfactuals with metaphysically impossible with genuinely impossible antecedents, um, and if those ones go trivial, they need to provide an account of how those things can still play a role in our reasoning. So what modern necessitarians do is move a few more counterfactuals from the uh, genuinely possible antecedents box into the genuinely impossible antecedents box. But everybody needs these two boxes. That's the line. And so there's not really any uh, like deep theoretical um, pressure to keep the uh, counter-nomics um, on, in one box rather than another, uh, at least that's, that's the thought. So we still need a strategy for tr trying to kind of explain away the apparent epistemic role of these counter-nomics in scientific theorizing and counter-mathematicals in mathematical theorizing, counter-logicals in logical theorizing, and so on. So what strategies are there? Just going to look really quickly at a few. One of them is a kind of two-dimensionalist style response. So this kind of embeds the counterfactual within a uh, indicative supposition. At least that's the way I'm thinking about it. Um, there's a distinction between, in two-dimensional semantics, sometimes called considering as actual versus considering as counterfactual. And what this response does is to put the counterfactual, um, uh, kind of embed it in the considered... The counterfactual involves considering as counterfactual, but you kind of embed that whole thing into a further conditional that is meant to be have its antecedent considered as actual. So even the modal necessitarian wants to kind of be able to acknowledge the epistemic possibility that contingentism is correct uh, about laws of nature. So they can say this sort of thing. They can say, well, if contingentism is in fact correct, then 
this counterfactual is, is true. The counterfactual is, uh, is true and non-trivial. So like in, in fact, the counterfactual is trivial. Um, uh, but if contingentism is, is correct, it's not. And so this strategy does kind of get you what you want, um, but, but it has a load of unlovely features. Uh, you get a complicated semantics for these sorts of, I mean, if that is meant to be like give, literally giving the truth conditions of countonomics, um, then their logical form is distinct from their surface form um, in a way that's not kind of obvious or easily easy to handle. Um, it, there's problems with embedding these. Um, and, but just generally, like the evaluation of countonomics is now parasitic on a metaphysical theory which is in fact false. And it's kind of hard to see why that would be of use systematically uh, in our reasoning. So I don't like, like this response much. <coughs> So another quite popular, I think, approach is uh, to go metalinguistic and to say instead of talking about the world when we consider these counterfactuals, what we're really talking about are our theories. So instead of saying if space-time were Newtonian, it would, would have a new Euclidean geometry, we, we, we switch from talking about space-time to talking about Newtonian mechanics and its models. So we stop talking about the world and start talking about theories about the world. And it's true that, if you, that, that models of Newtonian space-time do give it a Euclidean geometry. And that's true even if Newtonian mechanics is metaphysically impossible. So now we have some like, genuine non-trivial counterfactuals of the form, um, like, if we were to kind of adjust our theory so as, of, the, of the world so as to make that theory Newtonian, we'd then be able to derive certain consequences from it. Those, those things are just straightforwardly true. Um, and even from a modal necessitarian perspective, they can be straightforwardly true. Uh, so the idea is that you kind of use the non-trivial truth values of these things, these claims about the theories, to explain the role they play in our theorizing. And I think this works. It's not, <clears throat> I mean, I think the previous option works as well, formally. It kind of recaptures what we want. There's a question of like, how good the explanation of our epistemic practice is. In t so we kind of take ourselves to be reasoning about the world and its counterfactual features. Really, we're reasoning about our theories, and we kind of don't notice that. Um, is that a very good explanation of, the, of, of what we do and why it's successful? I'm not, I'm not going to dwell on that here, because this isn't really a talk about the metalinguistic response. I, I want to move on to contrast this challenge from physical theorizing with some other challenges. Um, but I, I think it does too much damage to logical form. It kind of looks, these sentences look like they're about counterfactual features of the world, but they end up being about counterfactual features of our theorizing. It's a bit unsatisfactory. And it's kind of, we often don't know whether a claim is countonomic or not. So we kind of don't know whether to read it as metalinguistic or not. That looks like a kind of problem for this view. Another this kind of similar approach is just to go error theoretic and say um, that we're just wrong. Um, we're just make, kind of making a, a, a mistake when we reason in terms of countonomics. Um, so it's not like the truth conditions of what we, the semantics of our countonomic assertions are given by the metalinguistic theory. Um, but those metalinguistic facts are kind of are still true and they're still in the vicinity and they can explain why we uh, kind of go well when we reason about the counterfactual consequences of these uh, impossible theories. And I think this is like a, quite a plausible um, response. It doesn't involve complicating the semantics of what we say. Like the semantics of what we say is what it looks like. We really are um, reasoning about the counterfactual cons consequences of space-time being Newtonian. Um, we're wrong to think there are kind of non-trivial counterfactual consequences of that. But these counterfactuals in the vicinity, these, these metalinguistic counterfactuals in the vicinity, kind of explain why, despite our being wrong, we still end up with like good physics at the end of it. And so this, I think, is probably my kind of overall preferred response at the moment. Um, 
And error theories in general aren't great. We should like understand ourselves as not confused where we can, but maybe this is a case where we should just accept that we're a bit confused. Um, metaphysics is hard. It's not surprising we got confused when um, uh, we had some like deeply ingrained false theories about the contingency of laws of nature. And a last response is <coughs> more fictionalist. So these are kind of various way ways of being anti-realist about these countonomics. So they kind of rec they fall into recognizable camps. And another way is to say that there's a sort of pretense that we engage in when we uh, engage in countonomic reasoning. We pretend that those, um, and indeed these other forms, countermathematical, we kind of pretend that those antecedents correspond to genuine possibilities. And this would be a kind of pretense, this is kind of like Kendall Wharton style fictionalism, not a kind of in the fiction operator style. Um, and I kind of like this approach, but you need to say something a bit strange about what this pretense involves. It's a kind of pretense you can engage in while being neutral on whether the thing you're pretending uh, reflects reality or not. Um, so you can kind of, it's a kind of pretense that is agnostic on whether it is a pretense, in a sense. It's a, um, like, well, I'm just going to kind of, engage in this pretense without uh, worrying about whether it in, it in fact re reflects the world. And I've been trying to think of a nice analogy. I'm sure there's some kind of like games uh, or th um, where you kind of take yourself to be pretending something and it turns out that what you're pretending is actually exactly what the case is and you just don't know whether, whether it's a pretense or not. I bet that somebody can come up with a, a real life example of that. That would be great. But um, So those are the basic responses that I have in mind. So just summing up... Um, the kind of this first chunk of the talk. Um, you could respond to the challenge from physical theorizing for modal necessitarianism by rejecting counterfactual aboutness. Um, that's going to solve the problem. It's also going to solve the problem of counter mathematicals, counter logicals, counter metaphysicals. But it comes at a cost. I think I don't want to pay that cost. So I'm interested in approaches that uh, maintain counterfactual aboutness. And there are a few different ways. These so-called deflationary accounts of the epistemic role of counterpossibles in physical theorizing. Either the counterpossibles like, uh, aren't really counterpossibles or they aren't really kind of full-bloodedly uh, asserted as an essential part of the theorizing. And the kind of the core uh, response to the challenge here. Um, is to emphasize the fact that the role that these counterfactuals, these counternomics are playing in our physical theorizing is an epistemic role. They're not uh, meant to capture some aspect of the way reality is. Uh, what we're the data that we're trying to account for is the fact that we use these counterfactuals in our theorizing. It's not obvious that like, the theory we end up with at the end of, end of time, once we've finished physics, will be committed to any of these counterfactuals being non-trivial. What, like, what we need to account for is their apparent usefulness along the way in finding out what is the true fundamental physics. So what we can give these kind of deflationary responses that say these counterfactuals uh, like don't really have the truth conditions that we, we thought they do, or they're um, really embedded in a pretense. But nonetheless, we can still account for the epistemic practice of considering them. We don't need to take them as literally reflecting counterfactual reality to account for that epistemic practice. Um, and that response is not going to work in the next two challenges I consider. That's, that's, that's the worry. Um, so the next challenge, so set aside kind of the use of counternomics in trying to discover which theories are true. And now we're looking at the use of counternomics in uh, telling us what reality is like. And it looks like this is the challenge we're going to need to do that um, when describing the causal structure of the world. And later on, the last challenge will be describing the grounding structure of the world. So how do counternomics feed into our like, account of the causal structure of the world? Um, well, I'm going to approach this through the kind of lens of interventionism, whereby what causal claims amount to um, are claims about the counterfactual consequences of interventions of various kinds. And Woodward is the kind of 
to philosophers of uh, science, the kind of philosophers of um, physics, metaphysicians, probably the most well-known kind of proponent of interventionism. He's the one that metaphysicians have engaged with most recently. Um, and his version of interventionism, at least, allows for uh, interventions that are physically impossible for some reason or another, that intervening in a certain way would violate the laws of nature. He doesn't allow for metaphysically impossible interventions, but he does allow for physically impossible interventions. And he's doing that against an assumed background where the laws of nature are metaphysically contingent. So his, his counterfactuals with physically impossible antecedents, like interventions that like, the laws of physics rule out but no law of metaphysics rules out, um, those are going to trivialize in the context of modern necessitarianism. They'll say, if we make this physically impossible intervention, then dot, 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 but physically impossible interventions are just objectively impossible, given modal necessitarianism, so we don't end up with differences in truth value between these interventionist counterfactuals of the physically impossible intervention kind. And so we don't have the capacity to explicate what we take to be this causal structure of the world. Um, so here are some cases. Um, this is not a problematic case. Just because an intervention is hard to do, we can't do it. Like operating a Maxwell's demon to kind of uh, create a temperature gradient between two boxes of gas that doesn't exist to start with, just by letting the hot molecules through the door, the, the fast molecules through the door, and not letting the cold molecules through. Um, that's the kind of thing that we can't, no, we, no, we can't intervene in that way. But we take it that that kind of process could happen by accident. So it's like it is physically possible for like one box of gas to spontaneously heat up and the other cool down. It's just really, really, really unlikely. Um, so that kind of intervention um, isn't going to be a problem even given modal necessitarianism. Um, but lots of others are. So one kind of intervention would be the kind that violated a conservation law. So conservation of energy um, looks like the kind of thing which is a candidate for a metaphysical necessity, for modal necessitarianism. Energy is conserved as a matter of metaphysical necessity. Um, and so if you need interventions to capture the causal structure of the world that um, violate conservation of energy, then they're not going to be physically possible. So here's a kind of example that um, uh, I, I think you find in Woodward. Um, kind of the, the sun is the cause of the elliptical motion of the Earth. Um, get rid of the sun, and the Earth is no longer going to move in an ellipse. It's like causal explanation of why the Earth, in fact, moves in an ellipse. Um, so how do you capture that causal claim for Woodward? It's going to involve at least the thought if you were to intervene to remove the sun, uh, then the Earth would uh, cease to move in an elliptical uh, orbit. But you can't just re intervene to remove the sun. There's a whole lot of mass energy there. What are you going to do with it all? It looks like an intervention to remove the sun is going to violate conservation of energy. It's going to be a physically impossible intervention. Now, Woodward is fine with that, as far as I can tell. Um, but a modal necessitarian can't be fine with that at least if they want to be interventionist about causation and uh, assert that there is genuine causal structure of this kind in the world, which I think there is. Like, I think it is just straightforwardly true that it's the presence of the sun that causes the uh, actual elliptical orbit of, of the Earth. So that's a problem. Another problem is changing kind of deep, deeper structural features about the physical world, like its dimensionality. So this is another uh, example that Woodward considers, um, and other people have considered this example as well. There are arguments that you don't get uh, stable planetary orbits in uh, classical mechanics, Newton sorry, Newtonian mechanics in four dimensions. Uh, so if, uh, so, and Woodward thinks that's a causal explanation. It's like the cause of stable planetary orbits is the three-dimensionality of space. Maybe you could quibble on that one with that, with that causal claim, but just run with it. Uh, interventionist style, that pans out as if an intervention were to change the number of spatial dimensions from three to four, then the orbits of the planets would become unstable. Um, 
So the three-dimensionality of space is the cause of the uh, stable orbits of the planets. The intervention that changes a number of dimensions from three to four, at least relative to Newtonian mechanics, is a metaphysically impossible, is a physically impossible one. Um, Woodward considers it, presumably, he doesn't consider it metaphysically impossible. I'm actually not sure exactly what he, he says about that, but um, he certainly kind of, he thinks you can consider it, even if you can't do it. Um, uh, Mark was, uh, gave us a talk on Monday, and he's certainly not convinced that that counts as, a, as an intervention. Um, but um, if it is an intervention here, then it's a physically impossible one. Small scope for argument, maybe like um, in string theory, there are like different like vacuum minima with different dimensionalities of, of space-time at them, different compactifications, and maybe we could tunnel from one to another. So maybe in string theory, it actually is physically possible for the dimensionality of space to change. Seems kind of a bit implausible. But um, in Newtonian mechanics, at least, we've got this, this, this problem. So upshot is that this is a problem that I don't really know how to solve for modal necessitarianism. Um, because all of these deflationary strategies applied here have bad consequences. So if we take the two-dimensionalist approach, we can end up recapturing the causal claims, but only relative to the supposition that contingentism is correct. That's not really what modern necessitarians want. Because here, we're not just describing some kind of like epistemic practice in doing physics. We, here, we're trying to explicate what we take to be the real structure of the world, it, it, the real causal structure of the world. And we want to have that be true, not just true relative to a supposition or true um, in some fiction. Um, and we want it to be true of the world. We don't want it to be just this like, causal structure amongst our theories. Sure, there might be causal structure amongst our theories in the sense that like, if you intervene on a theory, you get a different theory with different properties. Um, like I write down the theory, I intervene to change what I wrote down, now I've got a different theory. Um, but that's not causal structure of reality, that's just causal structure amongst the, the theories. Um, and if we take the error theory approach, then we get an error theory of these causal claims, and we don't want that, I take it. Um, so this looks like a serious problem for modern necessitarianism that can't be solved with the kind of maneuvers that deal with the challenge from physical theorizing. And like the challenge from physical theorizing is what most people, including myself, have always taken to be the, the big problem here. But actually, I think this problem of causal structure is lurking in the background and is harder. Um, however, lurking one step behind in the background is an even harder problem. Um, it's a very comparable problem relating to grounding structure. So basically, you can kind of take everything I just said about causation and start saying it about grounding, and you've got a, a new problem. Um, so, so I've got a couple of papers, and Jonathan Schaffer has a, a paper where we uh, develop in detail the uh, analogy between grounding and causation. And my, one of my papers like tendentiously argues that grounding is a kind of causation. I don't need anything as strong as that here. But just um, the core connection, which both me and Schaffer agree on, that grounding claims, like causal claims, entail non-trivial interventionist-style counterfactuals. And so in particular, you're capturing the asymmetry of grounding via an asymmetry in the counterfactual consequences of various interventions. So broadly speaking, the thought is that um, if you've got a fact that is a ground and a fact that is grounded by it, um, and you intervene on the, the ground, then that intervention gets uh, uh, kind of ramifies to the grounded fact. So it kind of, you get the kind of rippling downstream effect of your intervention on the, gra the, the thing that does the grounding. And uh, so intervening on that um, changes the grounded thing. But you, the asymmetry is that if you intervene on the grounded thing, you don't thereby change the thing that grounds it. At least that's the, the uh, proposal for capturing the asymmetry of grounding in an exactly analogous way to the way interventionists capture the asymmetry of causation. And the thought is because the interventionist account is a really good account of the asymmetry of causation, and because grounding and causation are so analogous in all the relevant ways, 
Um, this interventionist account is also going to be a good account of the asymmetry of grounding. And I think it works out in, a, in, in cases in, in quite a nice way. Um, <clears throat> so here's a kind of case. Um, suppose that, uh, just to take one of the kind of less controversial examples of reduction in thermal physics, um, pressure uh, being grounded in the collective motion of the molecules of a gas. Um, so the pressure is um, uh, proportional to the average momentum in a straight line of the gas molecules. Increase their average momentum um, and you increase uh, their, so it's like a average like magnitude of the momentum. Um, and if you increase that, uh, then you increase the pressure. So the idea is, if you were to intervene on the uh, momenta of all the particles, such as to uh, ground, one, one nuance here is that these interventions now are interventions to ground things being a certain way, not interventions that cause things to be a certain way. So maybe if you like, kind of imagine God reaching in and kind of like differently grounding things, rather than like actually, uh, actually causing. Um, but uh, if you were to like intervene on this system so that kind of lots of stuff stays the same, but the particles have a higher average momentum, the pressure is going to go up. But if you intervene directly on the pressure to ground it's having a different value, now like its value is grounded in something else, not in, the not in the motions of the molecules, but in like your intervention to ground its new value. So that intervention leaves the motions of the molecules untouched. That's the idea at least. So intervening on the motions, uh, corresponding change in the pressure, intervention directly on the pressure variable, no corresponding change in the motions. Um, it's a bit hard to get your head around these grounding interventions. Um, but the, the point is it's just analogous, and, and we, I'm sure we can talk more about that in, in Q&A if you want. But these sorts of counterfactuals here aren't just counternomics now, they're counter-metaphysicals, because we're having to consider what happens when you break the, connection, the grounding principles that connect the different levels, that connect the uh, molecule motion with the pressure. Great. Um, so here we've got an apparent commitment to counterpossibles um, that aren't just counternomics, but are counter-metaphysicals. Um, so this is a problem for everybody, not just for modal necessitarianism. Because most people, at least the people that aren't like, contingent about all the principles from metaphysics, that think that me the, the ma mainstream view is that metaphysics is non-contingent. Um, and so the mainstream view is going to be that those sorts of interventions are counterpossibles. And so now we have a version of that problem from causal structure that affected modal necessitarians, but now it affects everyone. Um, so two-dimensionalism makes these grounding trains only true relative to the supposition that metaphysics is in fact a contingent subject matter. Me Metalinguistic um, approach ends up like capturing dependencies amongst our Grounding theories, not about, not amongst things in the world. Uh, the error theory ends up saying all these grounding claims are false, but something in the vicinity explains why we get things right by using them. And a fictionist approach says that uh, these grounding claims are only true in the fiction. Like none of those are very satisfying um, responses for grounding realists. Um, and so the problem from uh, grounding structure affects everybody. That's the idea. And so the dialectical kind of force of that last um, challenge is to point out that although it looked like there was this serious hard problem from the causal structure of the world for modal necessitarianism, there's an analogous problem that affects everybody um, in accounting for, for grounding structure. And I posit the conjecture is that a good solution to the problem of grounding structure um, is something that the modal necessitarian will be able to use to defend themselves against um, 
the objection from causal structure that just affected them. So they can just kind of pit that kind of everybody needs a, a response to the more general problem of grounding structure. And then once more necess necessitarians have one of those, they can also use it to solve their own special problem uh, with causal structure. So the challenge from physical theorizing, uh, I think, can be handled. Um, there are various options. It's not, I haven't said, argued here for one option in particular, but I have argued that because what we need to do fundamentally in the, with this challenge is account for our epistemic practices, um, these sorts of deflationary responses are available and reasonably plausible. But those deflationary responses don't work for the challenges from causal structure or grounding structure, and we need a more serious response to that. And whatever we end up doing um, is the kind of thing that the uh, modern necessitarian can co-opt and use to respond to the challenge uh, from causal structure. So modern necessitarians really aren't actually any worse off than anybody else. Uh, with respect to any of these problems, they just look like they were. At least that's the, the optimistic uh, line I'd like to take. <laughs> so <laughs> just focusing on the challenge for... Uh, challenge from grounding structure, which I said is a problem for everybody, just want to kind of sketch two broad ways out. Um, one is to give up counterfactual aboutness and go in for impossible worlds. That's where Schaffer goes, for example. Um, I think reasonably plausible. I have special reasons for not liking impossible worlds, but they're kind of peculiar to my, uh, my modal theory. Um, the alternative would be to go less realist about grounding itself and um, to adopt kind of realism about causal structure in the world but anti-realism about grounding structure and then you can maybe try to explain away the apparent role of grounding claims in doing metaphysics of science but um, in some way or other uh, maybe and this is kind of my, my favorite way of doing that if you wanted to would be to say that we're kind of really good at reasoning causally. We kind of evolved to reason causally. We've got really good causal reasoning modules. It's not surprising that we're kind of tempted to try and use that when we're doing metaphysics. And what happens when we point our causal reasoning module at metaphysics is that we get grounding. But it's really like pushing it beyond the domain in which it belongs. And it's, uh, it's, it's, doing, it's, it's leading us astray there. Um, and on some days, I, I, I feel the force of that, that thought. Um, okay, thank you.